Welcome to another edition of the Giants Huddle Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the New York football Giants. I am John Schmelk, back from Indianapolis and the NFL Combine, and to break down everything that happened, we're joined by the chief scout for OurLads.com. You know him for the depth charts, but they have a really robust scouting side as well, and the man who leads that is Dave Severtsin. Dave, how are you, man? Awesome, guys. How are you doing? And welcome back from Indianapolis. I wish I could have been out there with you guys. Well, it's great, though, that we can, we can talk to you now. You watched everything the same way uh, we did. I prefer watching the drills on TV anyway, to be honest with you. So we're going to really try to drill in on, on some of the metrics and some of the numbers and what you thought of the on-field drills as well that are untimed, Dave, as you go position by position here. So, And then at the end, we'll do a little Giants at 6 talk, too. So let's go defensive line first. This is the order in which they went. And defensive tackle, it, it's not the best class Dave, in terms of guys going really high, I think you're only get will get one, maybe a second uh, first round pick in, in Johnny Noon, who who did not work because of that Jones fracture. And then, of course, you have Byron Murphy. And look, I think Murphy checked every box. The numbers are great. And I think to kind of set the stage here, we should make the point. The raw numbers are important, but more important is how guys do versus expectations. Right, Dave? And I think people, if you watch Murphy on tape, you know he's a smaller, quicker, explosive guy, and that's exactly what his workout looked like. Yeah, I mean, that's the theme of the defensive tackle group in this class. Now, you look at the top guys between Newton, who you mentioned, Byron Murphy from Texas, and someone who's starting to make a potential name for himself as a late first, probable second, is Brandon Fisk from Florida State. The theme that all these guys have is get off, pass rush moves, But also, and this is a big deal for some teams, it's the lack of length. Mm. You know, you wish one of these guys could really measure out long enough, those 33-plus-inch arms to kind of keep blockers at bay and and have a little bit more variety with the rush moves, and none of them have it. So I think that's going to be something that we knew going into the combine, but it was confirmed via the measurements. And then, you know, watching some of these guys with the bag drills and and how quickly they can get off their feet and how easily they can bend – That is a theme that a lot of teams are looking for. And I think with the new defensive coordinator coming in from Tennessee, that I I can see one of these guys that we just mentioned being on on the top of their list at the start of day two, if and probably we'll see one of them fall. Yeah, you mentioned Braden Fitz from Florida State, just six feet tall. Byron Murphy, just six feet tall. And their arm length also not what you're looking for. So I agree. One guy we did not see work at, which I was disappointed by, who I think fits into that same category, Dave, is Michael Hall from Ohio State. You know, we saw him down at the Senior Bowl in Mobile where he is just, his get-off in those one-on-ones was off the charts. I, Whenever he tests, and I'm sure he'll do it at the pro day, he's going to test off the charts. I think he's another one of guys from this group that really kind of fits into that upfield three-technique type of conversation. Though I wonder if his length might be a little bit better than maybe what we saw from Murphy and Fisk. 63290. The difference between him and the guys we already talked about is length. 33 inch arms, 81 inch wingspan, big hands, and his get off. If you're going to evaluate these guys, you know, next to each other on that tier alone, Michael Hall's get off is the best. And he won so many times, especially on that first day and mobile that you just, you know, you, you can talk about techniques and size and power. If you can't touch him, you can't block him. And that's the kind of feel that Hall gives. And he played a little bit more inside out at Ohio States and some of those other guys did. And, you know, there are issues against the run with Hall's tape. You know, it's a pretty bad grade again when it comes to his run defense. But with what the Giants have in Dexter Lawrence and some of the up-and-coming guys they have, DJ Davidson and Jordan Riley, this is a kind of kind of guy that complements them very well. I think Giants, based on, again, the new D coordinator, what they had in Tennessee, Michael Hall's definitely going to be someone they run a look into, you know, interview-wise and workout-wise over the next month. One of the guys I'm going to throw into this category who I like down at the Shrine game in Frisco, and he comes from a good program, is Logan Lee. He's 6'5", mm-hmm. right? He's t- only 281 pounds, ran a 505-177 split on the 40-yard dash, had a vertical leap over 31 inches. And in Frisco, you saw the athleticism. He was getting a field. He had some burst. So I think if you miss that on some of these guys in maybe round two or round three – I think for me, Lee would be a nice day three pick that maybe you can develop into that type of speed rusher as well. Yeah, I mean, John, I know you guys are going to be talking what the Giants should be doing in rounds one, two, and three in the, in the coming weeks, right? And at some point, there's going to be a position or two that you just cannot address based on numbers. 
And like you said, that day three, early round four, even at round five, this is where the Giants could grab a guy like Logan Lee, who's going to come in, not project to be a starter, but with the defensive line rotation that they can set up, Logan Lee is a guy that just seems safe and reliable and, you know, limited ceiling, high floor type, technically sound, powerful, heavy hands. And again, that that word versatility is going to come up every single time you talk about him, uh, a credible inside out threat. All right, some bigger guys that maybe can do a little bit of everything. You know, I think Clemson's uh, Rook Ororo has been overlooked a little bit. And boy, he's not going to be overlooked anymore. 6'4", 294, a 4'8", 940, a one eight seven split. Good jumping numbers as well. You know, Clemson has had a down year the last couple of years. They haven't been able to figure out the quarterback position since Trevor Lawrence left. But I think he's a guy that you can move all around that defensive line, and he's going to be a really good pro and, and probably, I'd say, either round two or very early round three type of pick. Yeah, I mean, we're I'm really strong round two grade on him, top of round two. And he has that – he's had that outlook from the league since last spring. And and it's the body type. This is a guy with 34-inch arms. Uh, he's, he's every bit of 6'4", 294. If you ask fans – you know, who's going to be a better pick or higher pick, Tyler Davis or Rook back at this time last year. A lot of guys went went after the, the flashy numbers that Tyler Davis has put up. But when you project these guys, and this is the blurry line of projecting and scouting talent, it's all right, who are these guys going to be in three years? And what did they do in college? It's a tough, it's a tough line to balance. But this guy projecting forward is he reminds me of when the Giants drafted Dalvin Tomlinson. It was not a household name. You knew that he was never going to be a star, but he is NFL ready. And I've talked to a couple of ACC linemen from the past couple of years. And I've asked, I always like to ask, who's the best or most powerful player you've ever played against? This is the name that came up the most often, most common was Rook, you know, heavy hands and length, bend and underrated athletic ability. I was surprised by how well he moved in position drills. No, I'm with you. For a man that size to move that well is pretty impressive. All right, I'm going to throw a couple of names at you. You know, Darius Robinson is somebody that was really good at the senior bowl. You know, tackle end, I think it depends on the system, right? And then some of the guys that just impressed me from a physical standpoint, you know, Gabe Hall from Baylor. I think we saw him in in the senior bowl as well, like the body type matches. And then I was just impressed at how broad Mason Smith was. He's a gigantic human being. And then, of course, Chris Jenkins out of Michigan, who doesn't have have the numbers necessarily, but he certainly has the athleticism and and the look and the pedigree uh, of a player. Any of those four or anyone else at this spot really jump out at you? I was hoping you were going to mention Mason Smith because this is a kid that really bursts onto the national radar as a true freshman after being a top shelf recruit in 2021. He only played eight snaps in 2022 before tearing his ACL comes back in 2023. And some of us still had some high expectations for him and it, it didn't go very well, but you did see flashes and you have to consider a guy that big, that leggy, you know, recovering from an ACL, it's not going to be like Wandale Robinson nine months and you're good to go, right? These guys take longer to recover. And we started to actually see some more flashes that we saw as a true freshman, a couple of, uh, with just a couple of games left in the 2023 season, how he was moving. I know Daniel Jeremiah spoke about this a couple of times, woefully impressive, Re- really, really impressed by how he moved. And, you know, there's some Chris Jones vibes to him when you see that kind of height, weight, broadness, and speed, you know, is he a little rough around the edges? Absolutely. But, you know, the giants have had a lot of success scouting, projecting, and developing defensive tackles. And if they like this guy's tools and they can put him in the room with Dexter Lawrence, this could be one of the top value grabs in the draft. One name, his teammate, Mikai Wingo, undersized, absolutely. But the twitch and explosion and the intangibles, I heard that he just knocks the knock the doors down with, with his interviews with teams. Um, that's another name. If the team is going to really look for another three-tech type pass rush penetrator, Mikai Wingo, who wore that, Infamous number 18 jersey, you know, given to the LSU top captain on the team. Um, that That's someone to keep an eye on as well. Yeah, I, I liked Wingo better on tape. Mason Smith was yep. more, I think, impressive in person to me athletically. But I think, yeah, those two guys uh, will be both good pros. A couple of these groups, I have an uh-oh player. My uh-oh player for defensive tackle, it's Devondre Sweat. Um, mm. He weighed in at 366. For a man that size, I think his testing was okay. But... When the Giants drafted Dexter Lawrence, for example, you know this, Dave. 
he walked in here, he was listed at 340, 350, and you're like, all right, he looks good for 350. Like, he carries yeah. that weight well. Devontae Sweat does not carry 365 pounds well, at least in my opinion. It's a sloppy 365. And, you know, you wonder what he weighed in Mobile that he refused to measure at the Senior Bowl. I think he was probably yeah. pushing 380 if you want mm -hmm. to go by what he's at now. That would be a concern for me as an NFL team projecting him forward. You know, the, the eyebrow raise that you just gave as talking about him, that was my reaction when I heard that he did not weigh in at the Senior Bowl. I mean, it's not like we're expecting you to weigh 300 pounds. We know you're going to be a big boy. What are you hiding? And you look at him as a five-year career. Really wasn't a factor until the last, you know, 15 games of his career. What went on early in his career? And there are some whispers, right? I don't like to get too in deep into the rumor game unless they're confirmed that there were some discipline issues with him early in his career. And, you know, did he has he outgrown them? Um, is, he, is 366 going to be um, – a sustainable playing weight for him in the NFL. And if he's going to get drafted, I know some guys are talking about him as round one, round two. If you're just a run defender in today's NFL, I mean, that's you're talking round four earliest in this era of football. And, you know, I know that he did have a lot of impressive tape and someone probably will take a chance on him. I mean, we saw the Eagles do this with Jordan Davis, but you're talking about two completely different body types. You know, you can look at some of the measurables on your spreadsheet and say, Oh, similarities, but a Davis blew out his workout. And, but the, uh, the body type and, and just the overall mentality of these players, the intangibles matter a lot. Um, that's not what you're always going to see when you're looking at a combine spreadsheet and watching the highlights, but that, that those are questions. I think the interviews for him were probably more important than what he did on the field. You're ready for a change. Payday comes early with citizens. So go to that retreat. New you moves to the country. Now you're raising goats and launching a lifestyle brand. Are you ready for all that life brings? All right, let, let's go to defensive end here, Dave. And these guys, you know, they all kind of met expectations for me. So I don't want to lose my mind about a lot of these guys. You know, Chop Robinson's numbers were fantastic. We all thought they were going to be fantastic based on the tape. Jared, I thought Jared Verse actually might have outperformed a little bit what I thought he was going to do based on his tape. He was really good. Dallas Turner was awesome. We thought he was going to be awesome. You know, Latu was solid. You know, he didn't seem like the most explosive guy on tape. Well, he didn't jump that well, but he was really good in terms of the 40 stuff. So to me, all these guys at the top of the edge class, it was like, yeah, okay, you look like what your tape showing me. You're absolutely right. I mean, what's interesting about the names that you just gave, right? I mean, those are probably going to be the top four edge guys on everyone's board. They just might be put in different orders. They all have like that, that one question, you know, it's like that <laughs> prevents them from being a real top yep. 10 caliber edge rusher. You know, some of them it's size, some of it's, it's juice and explosion, some of it's lateral agility and bend. And, you know, I think that the, the one guy out of that group who I do not have as my current top edge prospect, but he opened my eyes with his measurements alone. It was Dallas Turner. Um, 6'2", uh, sorry, 6'3", 247, nothing to write home about. If anything, that kind of confirms that he's not going to be the number one edge prospect in this class because someone below 250 has never been the number one edge guy since 2013, Deion Jordan. Okay, but... And I promise you, by the way, if he weighed into 247, he probably played at 240. Yeah, yep, you're right. You're exactly right. And 34-plus-inch arms... 83 inch wingspan. That's top five of all the guys at the combine at the edge position. So there is size there, but John, the issue I have with his tape was a lack of power. If you look at all the top pass rushers in the NFL right now, there is a power element to their game. Yeah. If you don't have that, you can still be a very good player, but you can't be the guy because if the uh, opposing offensive tackle is not fearful of your bull rush and having them shrink the pocket, they can they can manipulate that. They can play against that. It's a, a hand that they get the play that you wouldn't be able to against the guy that can get low and strong. Um, but the, the thing that you can make a case for Dallas Turner is none of these other guys really answered the question. I mean, we saw Jared Verse tripping over his feet a few times, and the question with him is short area, change of direction, and agility. We saw a lot too at the senior bowl and here, just not measure in exactly where you want to. And again, the explosion is a is a big deal. The lack of explosion. I love lot too. He really might be the number one defensive, uh, sorry, edge player on the on my board when all said and done. But I am worried about the lack of juice 
you know, it, it's the medical history is also a part of this process. Um, and Chop Robinson, I love, he is the most explosive. He is the quick, the quickest, you know, quick pressure guy in the, in the league, which a lot of teams want now because teams are getting the ball out so fast. Now you need someone that can quickly get on the quarterback. And I think Chop does that better than everyone, but that wingspan, man, like that is, that is scary. I think it was yeah, seven, just over 76 inches. For those that don't track that, that is off the chart small when you're talking about top of the line edge rushers. Absolutely. Two guys in this group I think are interesting. Mo Kamara out of Colorado State. Mm-hmm. Now, the problem is that he's only six feet tall, six one, right? And for an edge rusher, yeah. that's that's small. 248 pounds, not great. But boy, Fendi, explosive, you know. 10-yard split was 158, which is really, really good. Uh, Jumped pretty well. 32-and-a-half-inch arms, not the worst. Not great, but not the worst. How early do you think a guy like Kamara can go who did have production in college, is undersized, but does have a little bit of juice? You know, I, I've been debating Kamara with uh, Dane Brugler from The Athletic for a few months now. I think it was September, October when we were texting on a Saturday night about this kid. And I, I have a fourth-round grade on him. Um, I, I think the lack of size. So to I don't want to speak for Dame. We'll wait we'll, we'll to see uh, what the beast says about him. But it sounds like him and some of the others that I talked to uh, in this field say that it's going to be more of a late day three pick. But that production, that juice, and I want to tell you this about his game. You saw this at the combine, and you see this on tape. He's big where it matters. I mean, his hips are unbelievably power. He is a bona fide speed to power guy. You know, he doesn't have a lot of juice uh, behind his bull rush because he's 248 pounds, but so is Dallas Turner. And if you're going to ask me who has a ba- a better power repertoire, who's better at setting a true edge against the run, my, my vote goes to Kamara. You know, there's just some of the other elements to his game that Dallas Turner has that he doesn't, fluidity, um, you know, arm length, wingspan, all that stuff. Um, but Kamara, to me, is the kind of guy, kind of like what the Bryce Huff – has done for the Jets in recent memory. You know, you put him, you pin him down on third down, let him play that wide nine role, beat the tackle to a spot. He's not going to get pushed off his line because he's low and powerful, and he can be a really good situational player. All right. Uh, one other guy, Marshawn Neeland, I think is interesting. He played inside, outside the senior bowl. Good size, 267, 34 and a half inch arms. That checks all the boxes. It's 40 times we're fine, 475 best three cone and short shuttle of any player in Indianapolis. Combine that with his size and length. That's a second round pick. That That's a Dave Gettleman, Jerry Reese type defensive end right there. You know, that, that classic four, three DN, he has that body. Um, I like seeing these guys. There's a couple guys in this class, the kid from Mississippi, uh, Cedric Johnson. They have that, that four, three DN heavy hand, good agility. I mean, agility gets overlooked. I mean, I'm glad you brought up the, three cone i'm still i wish more of these guys would would put their three cone on on display at the combine and that, that used to be an every player thing just like the 40 uh but i guess we'll have to wait for their some of these pro days but, but that's an important trait for a pass rusher for a reactionary defensive player because there's one thing that i talked to a coach a former coach about the combine drills and with defense these guys get to choose when they start their movement obviously in these drills right there's no <clears throat> There's no snap that tells them or no count that tells them to go on the three cone, the 40. They're, they're deciding everything. The agility shows up when it's a reactionary. And this is a reactionary game. You need to be able to read and react at the snap of a finger and then use that speed that you displayed. And that's why I like these agility drills. Neelan can get in and out of his breaks really quickly. All right, let's jump over. Actually, one uh-oh guy at defensive end. And I thought the 40 time was fine. And the other testing was okay, but the field workout made me raise my eyebrow a couple of times. That was Braylon Trice out of Washington. Mm. Well, I actually like his tape. I think he's going to be a good player. I'd still be comfortable picking him end of the second round, top of the third. But boy, he had trouble dealing with the bags. I don't know if he yeah. was dealing with an injury and he was fighting through it or what, but yeah. his field workout just was was not great. You're right. I mean, and this is a guy that, you know, I admit I, I have had him as I had him as my edge one at one point in the fall, just because I love the guy's tape. I mean, I believe he led the the nation in pressures two straight years. I mean, that's a big deal. Yeah. And he's put against some really good tackles, guys that we're going to be talking about in the coming weeks. And his effort, I love these guys with that that engine, that motor switch that just never turns off. A lot of those hustle plays, but sometimes 
uh, we can fall victim to overrating that because in the NFL, you have to have a certain level of talent, physical ability, especially um, at the edge position. And Trice, I mean, he he weighed in 20 pounds less than I thought he would. It was 245 pounds. I thought he was going to push 260. That was one of the strengths I had on him, yeah. that he had that, that pro mass to him. Um, 32 and a half inch arms, a 47240, you know, nothing jumped off the screen from him. All, the entire workout. You're right. And the, the drills, there was something, some sort of concentration issue going on with him. Yeah. I don't know what was going on either. Very, very odd. All right. Linebackers. I don't want to spend too much time here. Uh, Peyton Wilson, I, I, you know, he was my top linebacker coming in. If you take health out of it. And I think he, he worked out that way. Edron Cooper, boy, he's built like a safety man. Like he is slight, but he can move. Uh, any other linebackers jump out to you. And if you want to comment on those two guys, you can too. Yeah, I mean, Peyton Wilson ran a 40 that you hope some corners uh, run, but you, you got to make sure you don't overrate that too much. It's just, it's an impressive feat. But I think the the red flag with him, obviously the medicals, he's had four season ending injuries, shoulders and knees. He's had over 10 surgeries um, in his lifetime, which is just, it's going to be a tough thing to overlook. Um, I bet some teams won't even have him, but the lack of length, you know, he has a hard time taking on blockers that shows up on tape. Um, and, you know, but he, he's a fun guy to have. And I said before the combine, one defensive question I had about the group overall was which linebacker would win the best athlete award. Because if you go back to the last few drafts, those are usually the first linebackers taken, the guys that really graded out well athletically. And Peyton Wilson, I mentioned at the end of the video, end of the video saying, hey, this could be the guy if he has a really good workout. And if again, if the medicals are going to ma matter a lot, but there is a, there is a possibility here. The name I want us all to keep an eye on is Cedric Gray from North Carolina. 6'1", 234, good length, great 40, jumped out of the building. Uh, really smart player as well, former offensive player. And you could see that there's some – some of that to him in, in the way he plays off the ball, just instincts. And his first step is always in the right direction. He always gets on the correct side of the blocker. That's something that's always fun to look for when you're scouting linebackers. Um, you know, day two prospect all day for him and a longtime starter. Yeah, I was a big fan of his. I thought he did good work down at the at the, at the Senior Bowl in Mobile. I thought he had a really good week there. John Tuttle is brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants from game day to every day. Citizens is made ready for Giant fans with insights, guidance, and solutions. Learn more at citizensbank.com. All right, let's jump the corner here. And I think this is really a chef's choice for what you favor and what traits are most important to you, Dave, when you try to you know stack the top four guys. Unfortunately, we did not see Kool-Aid McKinstry. Uh, they discovered he had a Jones fracture. They'll have to get that figured out. Nate Wiggins, who I still think if for one snap you could pick one guy to cover one other guy with no help, he's the guy I'm picking to do it. Ran a 4-2-8, uh, which is phenomenal. Unfortunately, hurt his hip flexor, didn't do anything else. Terry and Arnold, you know, ran in the four fives. He was fine. His workout was good. It was field work was good. And his testing was fine. I think if you liked him, you're still going to like him. And boy, Quiddy and Mitchell. You know, I wasn't positive about his speed watching his tape. Senior Bowl was like, all right, this guy's ball skills. He can play man. And boy, the athleticism got confirmed. If you walk out of Indianapolis saying Quinion Mitchell is your top corner, I have trouble arguing with you at this point, to be quite honest with you. It's a strong possibility. Um, like you said, pick your flavor. What kind of corner are you looking for? Cool. That's probably going to determine who your number one corner is because they are different from each other. And that's a good thing. Um, but Quinion Mitchell, one thing I look for in these combine drills, especially when the position drills start, who makes it just looks easy, look easy. That's what I look for. And that this comes from experience. I don't really have a metric or a number. And I know that's where a lot of us kind of get wrapped up into the numbers at combine time. Who makes it look easy? Who makes it look natural? And Quinion Mitchell sets the all-time record at Toledo for pass breakups. I think he was number two in the country this past year. Um, goes to the senior bowl, tears it up. And now he's going to the combine and proving that he might be the best physical package at corner. I mean, that's the trifecta right there. And a guy coming from the MAC, you need to show that you can play at a high level, dominate against the MAC, hang with the senior bowl, and then perform well at the scouting combine. One, two, three. He lined those all up and hit a home run on all three. So Kunyan Mitchell is definitely in the running to be the number one corner. Um, a name that I love for the Giants in terms of what they need within this cornerback group that they do not currently have is Mike Samersill from Michigan. Former wide receiver, 
moves to corner for a couple of years, ends up an all American. So, you know, he's, he's one of the best pure playmakers and we can overrate interceptions sometimes, but if you watch his tape, if you watch his interceptions, there's anticipation, there's obvious ball skills being a former wide receiver. And he knows what to do with the ball in his hands too. He's a return specialist and the guy's a dog against the run. I mean, he will support the run and in nickel defenses, which is now the base defense in the NFL, those nickels, they need to be able to tackle. This is no longer, hey, we'll, we'll pay the other guys to tackle because teams are now exploiting this. They're attacking nickel with run with the run game. And you need a nickel in there that's not afraid and, and not hesitant. And right now, if you're asking me pre-free agency, what's one of the overlooked holes on the Giants roster? I think it's this spot. And he, he's a, a prime candidate to be a really good day two pick for the Giants. Yeah, I was worried about his speed coming into the combine. I think he ran, what, a 4 5, four, five one, something like that, which is yep. for slot, that's fine. He it yeah. checked the box. His three cone and his um, shuttle were, were both very good. Very good, good play in the ball. I think if you need a slot guy, he's a really good name. Uh, before I jump to another guy I like, Wiggins' frame. How much is that going to give teams pause? Because, boy, I was joking. He's got a cartoon character, right? That's two-dimensional. If he turns sideways, he disappears. That's <laughs> Nate Wiggins. I mean, he is a beanpole, man. What, 173, I think he checked in at? Which means, yeah. again, you know he drank a lot of water, which means he probably played sub-170 over the course of that year last year. Oh, I put money on it. I mean, that was another thing when I talked to Dame Brugler. That was one thing that we said. It was like, how much is this kid getting away? I mean, if he didn't have an afro, like you said, he'd disappear if he turned sideways. But... You know, it's that's going to be a concern with him. Absolutely. I, I don't want to get burned for the second time in a few years on that because I put Derek Singley slightly above Sauce Gardner for that body type <laughs> reasoning <laughs> that he was just a little too thin. I mean, you know, especially a corner, you know, corner and quarterback are like two positions you just have to kind of really evaluate exclusively. It takes longer to evaluate these guys because there's so much detail to it. And one thing I you need to know in, in a corner like Wiggins is, can he run with guys down the field and can he cover underneath? Can he react to, can he anticipate routes? And sometimes having a light frame like that helps you in both those regards. So I'm not going to downgrade him too much on his body type, but I will say every single time, you know, a running back, Derek Henry comes downhill at him and they, they meet and they collide. You're going to cross your fingers and pray to God that he gets up. Yeah, and those corners can't cut the offensive linemen coming out there way anymore either. So yep. you're right, yep. 100%. Two other corners real quick. Max Melton from Rutgers. I got to get a love to the Jersey guy, man. And I had a chance to talk to him at the Senior Bowl for a couple minutes. Really nice kid. Uh, his tape's pretty good, too. I think he could be a day two pick. And then I think the workout really just confirmed it. 4 3 9 40, 1, 5, 1 split. Jumped out of the building. I thought Max Melton had himself a day. 32 plus inch arms too for that frame is a big deal. You know, I mean that he's going to play longer and bigger than 5'11", 187. Uh, he jumped off just like you, John. I, I saw the same thing um, at the senior bowl, uh, just how competitive and how twitchy he played. And then he tested out such, su such a, at a high level. If you look at the RAS score on him, he's going to be top 1% ever of all the corners to ever work out at the scout and combine. So this is a kid that just plays a pro style right away. I think he can fit into a multiple schemes right, and B multiple roles. I do see some inside out in him and similar to what we see. I mean, that's a big reason why everyone loves Arnold from Alabama is that he can truly play the nickel. He can play on the outside. I feel the same way about Melton. Two bigger corners where if you're looking for a bigger perimeter guy, Tyree Jackson, had a really nice day. It's six three, almost six four, one ninety four. Ran a four five, jumped out of the building, and then I thought Cam Hart from Notre Dame had himself a nice little day too. I think he almost measured it at six four as well. If you're looking for big corners outside, I, you can't go wrong with either one of those two guys. Yeah, should we just give them to the Seahawks now? Or <laughs> do we have to wait till draft week? <laughs> well, or or Washington, right? With uh, with uh, Dan Quinn there, I would circle, yep. I, I would circle him for that team as well. Absolutely. You know, there's another kid that kind of fell into that tier. I didn't love his tape as much as the two that you mentioned, but Richardson from Mississippi State, 6'2", 188, uh, ran a 4'3", 4, 4, 1, 4, 8, 10-yard split. I mean, th those are some rare numbers. He's not as polished as a corner when it comes to techniques, but, you know, coaches, you know, now that the coaches are getting involved in this draft process, they're going to see someone like that for the first time. They don't watch as much film yet. They'll catch up. They're going to see a guy like, hey, give me him. Let me work with that. We can make it work. All right, let's go to safety. 
Not a lot of guys did a ton of work here. So we're, we can go quick through this. I'll just throw a couple guys that jumped out of me. Unfortunately, to pull up on a second 40. But after a really good senior bowl, I thought Cole Bishop was great again. I thought he covered really well down in Mobile. His workout was great. 4-4-5-40, four, four, almost a 40-inch vertical, over 10-foot broad, 1-5-6, 40-yard split, 10-yard uh, split in the 40. I thought he was really good. Um I thought Kalen Bullock, he just ran. He ran well, and he needed to because that's his game. And then I was happy with Javon Bullard's run, too. He ran a sub 4-5, which I think he needed to do at his smaller size, just 5'10", 198. But those are three guys that I like coming in, and, and they kind of confirmed, all right, these guys are what I thought they were. Yeah, I mean, uh, on those guys, I mean, Bullock is on tape. He reminds me, of Nate, he's like the safety version of Nate Wiggins. I was surprised he he weighed in at over 180, and it was he just yeah. he was just under 190. I mean, some of that's got to be water weight. He looks thinner than Wiggins on tape, um, but he's got the playmaking ability that you want on the back end. The anticipation, him and Cam Kitchens are the two guys that you can see when you watch the All 22 on them. They they're moving towards the ball before it's thrown. They just have that great instinctual feel, um, great eyes, great eye balance between the receiver and the quarterback. Um, Cole Bishop is a guy that on tape you love, the times you love, but he's small. You know, yeah. he, he's six, he's six two, two oh six, and you got to look into the deeper levels. I mean, twenty nine inch arms and a seventy three inch wingspan. You know, I go into the database of measurables that I have. I mean that. That almost never gets drafted be before day three unless there's a standout trade to him. Um, so, you know, could he break that? Absolutely. Um, I'm a big fan. He did not run. I like Malik Mustafa from Wake Forest. 5'10", 210. He's built like a brick house. He plays like one as well when he plays downhill against the run. And, uh, you know, the, the safety class in general, I think, is a little underwhelming. Um, the one name I want us to keep an eye on is Miles Harden from South Dakota. Uh, 5'11", 195. Uh, really good in the drills. I think if I, I evaluate these guys in drills, that's why it takes so long to watch this thing. Um, just like check marks, one, two, three on each drill for each player. And he was the one that walked out of the drill work with the best grade. So just keep an eye on him. You know, we still probably have some more catching up to do on film work for him. Uh, but I like what I saw out of there. And I think he's going to, Kalen King is a kid from Penn state um, corner, but I think he's going to move to safety at the next level. I think oh, he he's going to have to have to run at a four, six dude. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I, I kind of like it. I, I like the fit. I like the how some the Giants have done this with a few different guys. Julian Love being the latest one, where you know you take a corner and you put him at safety, but really he's a nickel. You know they call them the nickel safety now. I think he's someone that could find if he can find the right team, right role. He's got playmaking ability in him. He just can't cover receivers by himself. That that that's his biggest red flag. And now the one uh oh guy from this position is someone you mentioned, and his tape is good. But how hesitant are you on Cam Kinchins now? He ran a 4.65. And again, testing at safety is not the most important thing. We don't have to relitigate the Kyle Hamilton thing from two years ago. But yeah. at just 203 pounds, a 4.65, a 1.62, 10 yard split, and he just yeah. jumped nine feet. Those are uh, not so, maybe not historically bad, but if you look at his RAS score this year, I think it yeah. was either the lowest or second lowest among the whole safety class. That to me is a bit of a red flag. It is a red flag. And this, this is going to be interesting to see what happens to him because his tape is fun. You know, he, he makes a lot of plays. He's got great anticipation. He's a leader type. He's going to be a glue of the defense. Once he gets there, coaches will love the intangibles. But at some point, like I said earlier, it's talent. Do you have enough talent? I mean, if you told me that him and teammate James Williams we're going to have the same 40 and the same 10 yard split, despite being 30 pounds apart, I would have told you there's no shot that's going to happen. So he's a guy that I circled. I highlight my guys that I want to see their pro day. Um, you know, I don't put too much credence into the pro day clock, but hopefully this is someone that could, we, we can see his time come down a little bit because I do like the player, uh, but he's been round three, round four for me for the past few months. And this could actually move him lower than that. Uh, just based on, on you know some of the measurables that you have to put into the equation. All right, Dave, let, let, let's jump over to offense here. Uh, if we go a little long today, I apologize. We wanted to get to as many of these guys as we can. Um, Penix, uh, I thought he threw the ball really well. Tight spiral, was accurate, which is not surprising when he's unbothered in the pocket. He's, he's pretty good with this sort of stuff. I mm -hmm. thought Bo Nix was fine. Like, you know he doesn't have the biggest arm, but I thought his arm looked like what it did on tape to me. I thought he was pretty accurate. He did a nice job. 
And J.J. McCarthy also looked like the same guy he saw on tape. He missed on some of those deep balls down the field, something that he wasn't the best at on tape in Michigan either. But boy, those in cuts, even the deep outs, he put the ball on the line. They were on time. Those uh, little corner fades that they had towards the end, the little you know flag routes, I thought he threw those really well. So I thought both all three of those guys did a pretty nice job. Yeah, it's good. It's been an interesting top of the quarterback discussion for since the beginning of the process. And we start talking about these guys in August and September in depth. And it's just a it, it's just the one word that keeps popping up. It's just a very interesting group to talk about. You could even throw the three guys in that didn't work out. Caleb, Jaden yeah. and, and Drake May. It's just, you know, I'm looking at my grades right now on my screen. They're all within one or two points of each other. You know, it, it's just it's going to be fun to see. And it's all going to come down to interviews with, with where these guys come off the board. You know, do, are the teams feel safe with these guys? Is their chemistry? Do they trust the intelligence and leadership qualities? Which that's not what the combine's for necessarily. The biggest surprise of the group for me was McCarthy weighing in at 219. Didn't you think he'd be lighter than that? I did. Yeah, I did. Uh, yeah. So I, I think the question with him and Jaden Daniels is pretty similar in that can that can their bodies hold up? You know, and I am I am discouraged. I'll put it nicely <laughs> that he did not weigh in um that that's a red flag huge to me. red flag huge. you know what, what are you hiding you know bryce young weighed in you know when's you the Kyle last Murray. time a player didn't weigh in at the combine by the way i don't remember it i was gonna ask you that because kyler murray did you know remember is kyler murray six feet or kenny pickett's hands nine inches all this stuff they show up and they do it you know and it's uh you know, that, that's a bigger red flag to me than anything that is being said about Caleb Williams and the entourage and the medicals. I mean, that stuff doesn't bother me as much as it bothers others. And by uh, the I way, think, my understanding is that Caleb Williams was there till Saturday night. He stuck yeah. around for the workouts. My yep. interviews apparently went pretty well. I think yep. aside from like the agent stuff and all that other stuff, my yep. understanding is that he came off pretty well over the weekend, to be honest with you. Yeah. I mean, Jaden and Malik neighbors, I mean, someone's in their ear saying that that was a good idea, but I just don't agree, you know, um, because that is the question with Jaden is what do you weigh? Because that's going to cross, cross him off some boards. If it's below 195, 190, because you just don't see quarterbacks that size playing the NFL. You just don't, you know, especially guys that are going to be running with the ball and taking big hits. So, you know, you know, the, the, to close that up, I mean, I really like, I love Penix. I, I really do. I can't put a first round grade on him, but I love the fact that he seemed to me seems like the guy that's been through the most adversity of all these quarterbacks. And that often is the question, right? How does a quarterback respond to adversity? That's a huge deal once you get to the league and he's proven it in multiple ways that he can be that guy that can lead a room, lead a, uh, a team to victory and fight through adversity and, and come out on the other side, stronger and better than ever. I thought he had the best arm, best throwing motion there. Yeah, I would put Nick's in that category too. Everything he went through at Auburn, those two guys, yeah. you can certainly yep. check the box with those two. I'm with you 100%. As long as the medicals on Penix are good, which would yep. be big for a lot of these teams. I, I'm with you. I, I have more of a day two pick grade on him than, than a day one. I think his ball location can sometimes be a little inconsistent on some things, but yep. good player. You know, if you know somehow the Giants wind up with him around too, I would have absolutely zero problem with that at all. That. Giant fans love a winner. It's why they love Citizens. They need a 2022 Best Bank in the U.S. by the banker. As the official bank of the Giants and sponsor of the huddle, Citizens is made ready for fans of Big Blue. Learn more at citizensbank.com. We not, might not see a running back, Dave, until round three in this year's draft. I got to be honest with you. I was really impressed. I thought these guys worked out really well. You know, I didn't know. I haven't watched him on tape. I need to do it. Isaac Garendo wouldn't have known him from a you know hole in the wall. You know, two twenty ran a four three three. Okay, I'm in. I'm good. Yep. Under seven second three cone. Where do I sign up? Like, I'll watch him. I don't know how much you watched him. What your thoughts on him are before we move on to the rest of the group? Yeah, I mean, Garendo. He had one of the best five workouts we've ever seen. And again, we don't want to get overreactionary, but he was a guy that once he got invited to that East West shrine, I was like, Hey, we got to give this guy a look because no matter what, whoever gets invited to those games, you got to watch tape on and write up. And he has that juice. The juice shows up on tape. I don't think he has the best feel, which is a big deal with the running backs. You know, like I don't think he's going to play to that speed, uh, but he'll play at, at, at worst a four five type speed. And he's got the size. We're not talking about a 180 pounder that ran a four, three, right. he's got 220 pounds on that frame, but I'll tell you what giants fans. I mean, I don't know what they're going to do with Saquon Barkley, but if, if they part ways because of finances and Barkley, you know, signs elsewhere in free agency, this position group is a big deal draft weekend. And the name I like the most, I had him as my number one back 
coming into the season. He's still sitting there right now. I don't know if anyone else does, but I am a huge Trey Benson guy. Um, he, had, he had over six yards per carry at Florida State. He broke tackles at a record rate in 2022. 427 touches, not one fumble. Uh, he hit over 21 miles per hour, which is a metric that more and more teams are using uh, as opposed to these 40 times. Um, and that was the most among the running backs in the country in 2023. And we're talking about a 220 pound back. You know, the guy goes out and runs a 439, sorry, at 216. You know, and, and Jeremiah made this comparison. I went back and looked at some of the numbers, Brees Hall. That, that, that is what Brees Hall is, size, speed, and, and production. So that's a name that I would I loved that he did well at the Combine. Um, but no matter what, whether it's him, Bucky Irving, a guy that can pa- catch the ball out of the backfield, um, Tyrone Tracy is a day three name to keep an eye on. He was a wide receiver his entire career until 2023, and he balled out. And you know he's going to be a pass game factor. So if that's what the Giants need out of the backfield to replace Saquon Barkley, that's a name to keep an eye on. Yeah, Jalen Wright ran well. I, I mm. like Marshawn Lloyd, 220 pounds. You want bigger mm. backs? He ran a 4-4-6. Four, four, he, yep. he was the best running back in Mobile for the Senior Bowl. That's a guy, you know, I was really worried about Blake Corum's 4 e time. I thought we might be looking at 4-6s. Dude, four five three. where do I sign? That's a yeah. good number for him. With for- And his agility number is 6 eight, two, three cone four one two short shuttle. I think he's definitely going to be a round three pick now. He's going to be a good back in the league. And even like Ray Davis and Isaiah Davis, their numbers don't jump off the page, but for backs mm. of their size, that's more than good enough. I, I think yeah. they have a chance to be, you know, I think um, Isaiah is probably more of a day three guy. Ray could be a, a round three guy. So I think you have a bunch of guys that maybe they're not 20 carry a game guys here. Dave, you have guys that can play roles in an NFL offense pretty quickly. Yeah. Another name I'm, I'm confused by when, when it comes to the 40 is Audric Esme from Notre Dame. <clears throat> this guy runs, not comparing him to Ezekiel Elliott, but running style. He has that to him. He can be quick. He can be fast, but he will run you over if you don't square him up. He ran a 4-7-1. You immediately think, oh, big power back between the tackles only. A, watch the tape. The dude can move. He ran away from guys multiple times over the past year, but he jumped 38 inches, third best. He jumped, broad jumped, 10 foot, five inches, third best. The 40 this did ten, not match the rest of the testing. It was very yeah. odd. The 10 yard split was the same as guys that ran in the low four five. So I wonder if he just let up a little too early. You know, sometimes there's a skill to running the 40. That's why these guys practice it for two months. I wonder if something mechanically went wrong with him in his 40. I went back and watched it again. I couldn't find anything, but that's a name. If that 40 does push him into the fourth, fifth, sixth round, value pick all day. I love Bucky Irving's tape, mm-hmm. but at 5'9", 192, at 4'5", five, five, it's a mm-hmm. tough number. <clears throat> tough, it is. Tough number. Yeah, he he's going to be he, – there's a running back, J.J. Taylor from Arizona that uh, New England took a few years ago. I love this tape. I thought he was going to be the next Deion Lewis, James White type for them. It never really worked out because he just – that talent, it just wasn't enough, you know. But Bucky Irving is – he was one of my favorite football players to watch. Take everything out, um, all things considered. I do wish he worked out a little bit better. But his value is going to be third down back, you know, a passing game weapon. Maybe not an exact a, – a traditional running back. He's not going to be able to block. Uh, but I do think he could be a weapon. And you just have to, you know, properly gauge where in the draft he should go for you to use someone that's going to be kind of more of like a – I hate to use the word gadget, but that is what he's going to be, a gadget player at the next level. What kind of value do you place on that? Yeah, I wonder about his pass protection in some of those third down yeah. situations. You're going to have to use him in, in yep. a pretty specific way. All right, let, yep. let's jump over to tight ends here, Dave. Theo Johnson. Woo! Penn State knows how to train out workout warriors. And boy, they turned that another one in Theo Johnson, 45840 at 259 pounds and six foot six. I watched him at the senior bowl. I thought he looked fine. I didn't think he looked like that, to be honest with yeah. you, but good for you. Uh Ben Sinat, another guy I really like. I thought he had a good day working out. He could do a little bit of everything. And then I thought Cade Stover kind of matched exactly what you thought he was on tape. Anybody for you really jump out at you at tight end? I mean, Theo was the guy, you know, at the senior bowl. We did see that according to Zebra Technologies, he did run. He was the highest mile per hour tight end there. Um, He was up there with some of the receivers as well. But, you know, this this tight end group overall, you know, the the guy that I like the most, if I'm going to take a chance on someone and for the Giants, you know, you tell me if I'm wrong. It's probably going to be a day three pick if they use a draft pick on one of these guys. It's Jared Wiley from TCU, uh, 6'6", again. 
249, runs a 462, 1.26, uh, sorry, 1.62 split, 37 inch vertical. And I saw these traits. I thought he was going to come out last year. So I remember watching him a lot in the fall of 2022. And I was like, dude, this is a former quarterback that is still learning the position. Um, I don't think you're going to get a ton of help from him in the trenches. And that it's debatable if the Giants should bring in another tight end that can't really hold the, hold the point of attack. But if you're looking for an interesting pass game weapon that is going to pay out larger than where you would think a fourth or fifth round pick would, Jared Wiley kind of checked that last box that I needed to check for me to consider him one of those top sleepers in the draft. Good receiving weapon on tape. But did Jatavian Sanders really hurt himself running a 4-7 at 245? I think so. You know, um, I've been talking about him for a long time. I had him as tight end two coming into the year. And I said, Hey, there's not much of a difference between him and Brock Bowers. Now I'm going to have to walk that back and say that the, you know, you could put a Walmart between the two uh, in terms of how how much of a gap there is between, you know, similar size players and similar style players, but Bowers does everything better than, than Sanders. I still like him. Um, He's probably going to be closer to, round four, round five, than he was round two, round three. Um, unfortunate. I don't think he was on the practice field at Shrine. I know he was there. I think he was nursing an injury, correct? Yeah. Um, but, you know, the one thing about him, he's still raw when I watch him, but he does block. He's a former, when he got to Texas, they didn't know what to do with him. Keeping at defensive end or tight end, he was recruited as both in high school, and he was a beast, like just a violent player, and it shows up. Uh, he's not just a receiving tight end that's afraid of contact. So there's the mentality in there. And he did produce, he was a great tackle breaker in the end of, uh, with the ball in his hands. Great. After the catch, he was one of the best tight ends in the nation after the catch over the past two years, there's something there with him. But again, if you're going to be a big factor, I think you need to be a little bit better of an athlete. So again, he's another guy I circle to wait and see what he did at the pro day. Maybe he's just not ready because I don't think he trained as much as some of these other guys did over the past month or two. You love turf. You're good at it. So you start a turf biz. Business grows. Your savings grow. Become the most celebrated name in turf. Are you ready for all that life brings? All right, I'm going to save wide receiver for last because that's the, you know, big sexy workout position. But let's go to the big sexies that did work out on Sunday, the offensive linemen here. Interior, you know what? And I think this is a really good class, and I think we saw it on, on tape, Dave. Let's start with the interior guys first. A couple guys that I was got excited about, and these aren't the big names, but it's guys that I was impressed by, and I loved him down in Frisco. I thought Mason McCormick had a really good day. Just knows yeah. what he's doing. His tape's awesome. I worried about his raw athleticism. Well, it checked out. Good enough to play, and yeah. I, I think he could be a sneaky early starter in his NFL career with a lot of experience playing football at South Dakota State. I don't know about the power, but Holy Cross, C.J. Hansen, I thought he moved really, really well in field workouts. Again, just 300 pounds, 6'5". He's going to have to get bigger, but I thought he moved well. Uh, I liked him at the Senior Bowl, Tanner Bartolini out of Wisconsin. I thought he was more of a blue-collar guy, but boy, his workout was phenomenal. He showed some really good raw athleticism. He set a record you know, know. For, for all centers all time. He, he uh, the best all time three cone of all centers at the draft. Sorry, at the combine beat Jason Kelsey. That, that, that record has been there for a long time. And I remember I got there early for practice every day in, in Mobile and just watch these guys who got out there early, who didn't. He was the one guy every single day was out there before everyone else just playing against air, working on techniques, snapping the ball guard. He's got guard center versatility, which I know teams are going to love. And He's a much better athlete than I think some are giving credit for. Um, coming from the Big Ten, coming from Wisconsin, he immediately put that that road grader style on him. But he bends well. Um, he does lack length. So I think that he has the, the stereotypical uh, prototype center body, and, and I'm okay with that. And he's the kind of guy that I love to bring in. And if, if injuries start to pop up, kind of similar to what the Giants were able to do with Ben Bredesen, you know, injuries start popping up. You can, you know, move him between spots and interchangeable. That's that's the value that Bordellini will bring to the table. Agreed. A couple of the guys I just happen to like, and I liked him in Mobile too. I thought Charles Turner moved really well over the course of his on-field workouts. And then I thought, you know, 
Christian Haynes was fine. Dominic Pooney was fine. I know his 40 time wasn't very good. I, I really don't care about that. I thought he was fine. And then I, th- I like Isaiah Adams out of Illinois still. I know his workout wasn't the best, but I think as, as an interior guard, you know, early day three type of pick, uh, I think all those guys, you know, came out okay. And then Brandon Coleman worked his butt off. He did both guard and tackle at the senior bowl. And I thought he, you know, his his overall number, size, athleticism were just off the charts. Yeah, th- th- those are all good names. I think, you know, all the Michigan bodies there, you know, uh, you had Barnhart, Keegan, Nugent, you know, those guys are all just like that day three tier. You know, they're going to come in. And with, with the Giants, I've had issues with over the past few years. It's not just the starters. The, the backups weren't able to, to really come in and play at a high level. So I think these are the guys that you look at day three and say they might not be the sexiest picks in the world, but they're the guys that can help steady the ship when things start going awry in, in mid-year when the injuries pop up. Uh, the name that I'm going to keep an eye on, is Layden Robinson from Texas A&M, uh, 6'3", 302, uh, some of the best length and width you're going to see of all the players, really comfortable for the inside guys. But he he competed really well at Mobile, and I thought in the position drills, the ratings that I gave for these guys in position drills, he was top three in all of them. So I, I like what I see out of him. Um, He was a guy that could have come out last year as well, but he decided to go back to school. He's got some bad tape, you know, just some really ugly losses. But to me, they look mechanical more than physical. And just looking at the tools, the measurements and and what he did in drills, uh, I think if the right coach gets their hands on him, he's going to be a starting caliber guy. I like it. I like it. All right, let's go to offensive tackle here. And I've been trying to push this guy a little bit uh, since the senior bowl. And I think he's getting unfairly killed for the, Frankly, the really bad game he had against Michigan. I like Roger Rosengarden. I think he's better than what people give him credit for. He can move. He's 6'5". He's 308. 33 and a half inch arms are long enough to play offensive tackle. He ran really well. He's got a good punch. He's physical. I would be willing. I know I'm not. I'm on a ledge on this. I'd be willing to take him at, at the end of the third round. I think he's a good enough player to be picked there. A lot of people were down on him. I know. I thought he had a really good workout. I mean, I'm I'm right there with you. I'm looking at my grade. He's third round. I have third, fourth round grade on him. So, and and then that's not even considering I haven't thrown positional value into the grade yet. Tackle gets an extra point for me because of the the value they bring to the table. So, absolutely, third round pick um, because of the depth of this offensive tackle class. This the depth of the offensive line. I mean, I've never had this many first round grades on offensive linemen. Um, you know, when you're meshing everyone together. And because of that, you're going to see guys fall. And I do think Rosengarten's going to get overlooked a little bit by some. But this is a guy that I think the NFL will like more than media and fans because of the techniques. And the dude just doesn't lose. I mean, it doesn't always look flashy. It doesn't look great. He played across from Troy Futanu, who to me is the, the third or fourth best lineman in this class, if, if you're going to come, if you're going to throw in the versatility factor. And because of that, you know, you, you might overlook this kid, but he's – Washington has been putting out some quality linemen and I have some Caleb McGarry feel to him when I watch his game, you know, not the ideal, not the ideal measurables, but the guy that he gets the job done, he obviously tested out to be one of the best athletes at the position uh, at the scouting combine. And again, it's, 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 what are you really looking for? When you're watching offensive line play, the basic element is don't get beat. And that's what we see out of his game all day. You mentioned his teammate, uh, Fatanu. And I've been saying to myself all draft process, why does everybody want to move this guy to guard? And I'm like, all right, let me wait for the measurements. Maybe he's going to check in with like 32 inch arms or his athletic testing is going to be bad. Well, no, 34 and a half inch arms at 6'4", 317, over 30 on the vert, nine and a half on the broad, 501, 40, 171, 10 yard split. This guy checks every box. He's a tackle. He was a great tackle on tape. His measurements scream offensive tackle. Stop talking about him as a guard. <laughs> tackle. <laughs> You're absolutely right. And I'm going to have to admit something to you that, you know, p- part of the scouting process that I'm being taught from Dan Shanka is go back and self scout and learn where you made mistakes. What, like these guys that you miss on, why was it? Stop making the same mistakes. And Ray Sean Slater, a few years ago, I said, hey, I think he could be a good tackle, but an all pro guard in the Zach Martin form and chargers take him, and he ends up being an all pro, but at left tackle in, in, in year one. 
And throughout the year, I kept on saying Fatano inside, Fatano inside. Um, just be base. He looks like one, but that's not a good enough reason. So I'm trying to catch myself now and say, don't make this mistake again. So I do have him on my guard grade sheet and my tackle grade sheet. And the grades are similar enough to say, hey, whoever gets drafted by will dictate where he plays. Let's say the Giants, this won't happen at six. Don't worry, everybody. But let's say the Giants take him at six. All right. You're not putting him at left tackle. I don't even think they'd put him at right tackle right away. But what I've been saying about him, I thought for a while the Giants would be able to get him in round two. This guy is going to be a first round pick. So who knows what the Giants are going to do, trade down, trade up. But, you know, if they find themselves somewhere mid to late first round somehow, then, yeah, maybe I think he's in play. And that would be an interesting situation. What I like the Giants looking at someone that is a tackle that you can move inside while you give Evan Neal one more shot at right tackle. And if it doesn't work, you have your plan B right there. Um, that's the only situation where I would see Fultano playing on the inside. It's if he got drafted by a team that already had tackles, but if you don't have a tackle and you're looking for one, he's probably the best combination of athlete and power. Of, of all these guys. And, he, he, you know, Joe Alt's got a little bit more size than him, probably a little bit more upside than him. But you watch Fatanu play, he's going to add personality to an offensive line right away, and he's going to be able to hang. He's just not as polished as the guys at the top of the tackle group. Yeah, I don't know if he's going to get there. Jordan Morgan's one of those guys that I think yeah. can be that swing guy. I, I don't yep. know if he's getting to the top of the second round. He might not. Yep. He's really good. But that's another guy I think I put in that group. Just a couple box checkers. I think Tylesi Fuanga checked all the boxes you want. Tyler Guyton checked all his boxes until he got hurt. Olu Fashinu checked all the boxes. Morgan did all was good too. I thought Sua Matia was awesome from BYU. I think he might sneak into the first round. That could be like the eighth guy. It's crazy. And then the one <laughs> guy I want to highlight, and then you can hit on whoever you want. Amarius Mims, my God. 6'8, 340, <laughs> 36 and an eighth inch arms. My lord, sir, ran a 507. <laughs> And he jumped pretty well, too. He's, they have it in as a 25-inch vertical jump. I think that's wrong. They got to get that fixed. But, boy, you know, you mentioned Fatano. Keep him away from the Dallas Cowboys and the Eagles. Keep Marius Mims away from the Cowboys and the Eagles, too, please. Because that guy's if he can stay healthy and he hurt himself again in the drills in the uh, 40, yeah. he is yeah. going to be an absolute monster. Yeah, I mean, the question with him is just lack of experience. But at some point, at a position like tackle, you, you take a chance on this kid. John, I think there's a shot he goes top 10. I really do. Uh, because you you don't see this profile come across often. And it's not just a profile. His tape is quality. Yeah. I mean, he is a guy that makes it look easy. Sometimes reminds me of like a DeWan Jones type situation. When I talk about this from last year, Ohio State gets drafted by Cleveland, steps in for Jack Conklin week one and, and you know, plays his butt off. I mean, he made the R lads all rookie team. DeWan Jones as a fourth rounder. Mims is a much better player, but what, Dewan Jones does at a very high level that Mims already does as well, minus the experience, is he knows how to play his size. He doesn't overextend. He doesn't panic if he loses initially, simply because this dude is so hard to get around. A, heavy hands and length. And th that wingspan with those that the footwork, his hands, they're 11, they're, they're over 11 inches. I mean, everything about him is just big and it's good weight too. I mean, you looked at the video, the pictures of him. That guy doesn't have a bad pound on his body. So, you know, this is this is the kind of guy that I feel like every offensive line coach, it's their it's their dream to at some point come across someone like this, a black, a blank canvas, and say, Hey, can I develop this guy? And if you get him to his ceiling, I texted someone about this yesterday. If if he gets to 85% of his ceiling, he's a pro bowler. You know, if you get him to his ceiling, you're talking all pro. No, I'm with you. One of the guys that I like, curious to see what you think of him. What do you think of Christian Jones out of Texas? I thought he did a nice job at the Senior Bowl. What do you think about how he worked um, at the Combine and, and your general grade on him over the course of the year? Shocked by the 40. Um, he, he 504. I do think he plays heavier than 305. The measurement I had on him coming to the year, I think it was 325. So he probably lost some weight for the combine. I'll be curious to see what he weighs in um, at his pro day. But the issue with him is change of direction, reaction, anticipation. And you see some of that in the agility drills. He ran a, a 809 shut, a three cone and a four, seven, eight, three cone. Yeah. A little uh, stiff, sorry, right? Shuttle. He's a little stiff. 
very stiff and just gets a little too top heavy. But I, I mean, his profile is great. Great length. I think he's the kind of guy what the Giants were hoping to get out of Matt Pert is you draft him round three, round four. He could be a swing tackle. Maybe he develops into a starter, but just don't enter the process saying this is going to be a starting tackle for us at some point. Um, and I think that's where you peg him draft uh, grade wise. I'm with you. All right, let's go to the wide receivers here, and then we'll do two like generic questions, and 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 we'll get you out here. Xavier Worthy's forty was great, four two one. I'm more impressed by A.D. Mitchell, Brian Thomas, and Devontae Walker, who are thirty and forty pounds heavier than Worthy <laughs> is, and they ran the damn mid four threes. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Worthy's going to steal the headline because of, of the hoopla. I mean, even my wife and three year old son were staring at the screen when he ran his four two one. You know, just because it's cool, right? You know, when's the last, you know, the only reason we talk about John Ross right now still is because of that 40. So Worthy's name will be talked about for the years to come, but that was not the most impressive 40. It was Brian Thomas. Uh, Brugler put out a, a tweet saying, I think three times since in the past 15 years, have we seen a wide receiver above 207 run a 4-3-3 or better? And, you know, he, it's almost like Thomas gets, you know, put in the shadow of Xavier Worthy's 40, just like Brian Thomas got put in the shadow of Malik Neighbors and Jaden Daniels at LSU. The guy had a monster season. He had 17 touchdowns last year, Brian Thomas. And his tape is impressive, too. And he's still kind of raw. He's still relatively new to the to the game itself in the wide receiver position. So Brian Thomas, I will say with wide receivers, I had so this is such a crowded, jam-packed wide receiver group um, in the top 15, really. That his workout, I I put him in front of a few guys because of the workout. He's my wide receiver four now. Interesting, and I think I, to me, I think wide receiver four and five in this class are are AD or AD Mitchell and Brian mm-hmm. Thomas. Those are my two guys to have that type of speed, size, and those guys aren't linear players either. Like they yeah. can move side to side, they can get in and out of their routes. They have true and look, they're not there yet because I think both guys are raw. We saw it on the field workouts with Mitchell. He's got some work to do with some stuff, but. Their just ability to change direction and move the way they do with their size is unique that you just don't yeah. see that very often. Yeah, you have to gamble on traits like that at some point. And in relation to the Giants, that's kind of, in my opinion, pre-free agency. That's what they need. They, they need a big physical guy that can go win the contested situation to help offset the speed of Jalen Hyatt and the shiftiness and underneath playmaking of Wandale Robinson and the dependability of a Darius Slayton is you, if you can get a young wide receiver with size that can win contested situations with a T Higgins type upside, that's the name that kept coming up when I watched Brian Thomas and even s- some of uh, now Keon Coleman, although he didn't test that well in the 40, he did test very well speed wise in the drills. He was reaching speeds that nobody else did down there. So there, there's a lot of size at the wide receiver position class, uh, and you can wait till round two because I do think one of these guys will fall. And the guys that don't have size, but I thought did really well, Dave, you know, and you could put all these guys in the same bucket, I guess, though Ricky Pearsall is a little bit taller than the other two. Pearsall, mm. I thought, was very good, and that's coming off, I think it was only one or two dominant days of practice. I think it was one. I think he left after one day down at the senior ball mobile when he just killed everybody. Uh, he, yep. he was great. Lad McConkey broke 4-4, which is huge for him. Uh, awesome day for him. And then Roman Wilson was super fast, 4-4-1, and he was good in all the drills. So those three guys, if you're looking for more of an inside-outside combo player, I think all three of those guys did really well for themselves. Can't go wrong. I mean, McConkey running a sub-4-4 was one of my, one of my like, whoa moments uh, yeah, of me the too. weekend from the wide receiver. He's he's an interesting guy. I, I put some numbers into the system – who does he compare to beyond arm length and hand size? He's Garrett Wilson. That's who Lad is. That like when you're talking about height, weight, speed, change of direction, route running prowess, and how he did in the drills. I mean, he you just watch these guys run drills. And this is why I love the combine. You're seeing everyone, same environment, same playing field. And you can really get a good like comparison of these guys. And he was by far the snappiest route runner of them all. Just so sure. And he's going to be able to separate no matter who's whoever's playing quarterback for the Giants next year. You want some of these, these, these guys need to separate. And that's what McConkey does at higher level than everyone, all of them. Other guys I thought did well for themselves. I thought Jalen McMillan was good. I thought Jalen Polk was good. Um, Burton, I thought from Alabama did a nice job. Tony Franklin, I think he needs to check his cleats. He was slipping and sliding during the drills. I don't know why he was on the ground the whole time because that does not show up on tape. I thought yeah. Xavier Leggett did well by himself. 
How much does the Coleman 40 time worry you? You mentioned his speed was good in the positional drill, so maybe it doesn't. Sorry, who was that? Keon Coleman. Yeah, it doesn't bother me because of the basketball background. You know, these basketball players, I call them long striders, right? Where they're not always the most explosive from the get off, but once they get going, they, if they get over the top, they'll stay over the top. And you see that on Ke- Keon Coleman's tape. Um, you know, it, I had a, a late first ground, uh, late first, early second round grade on him coming to the process and nothing about the combine changed that he's a contested catch guy. He's a big physical try hard dude. And I still think that he's earlier on the progression curve than some of these other guys, meaning there's, there's more to get for him than some of these other guys. So, um, but I was somewhat alarmed by the 40 and then I erased the alarm by how fast he ran in the drills. So again, similar to SMA from Notre Dame, you can't put too much into the 40. It is a part of the process. I will not, I would be lying if I said it wasn't. Um, but the fact that he made up some of that ground in the drills, uh, was a big deal to me. The other uh oh guy I have in this group, and maybe it's more of a question mark than an uh oh. Isaiah Williams out of Illinois, he had the mm-hmm. slowest forty time. He ran in the four sixes, but you look at his three cone. It was one of the best of the group, I believe. Or was it a short shot? One of the other. One of his one of his agility Joes was top three or four in the group. His jumps yeah. were right in the middle of the pack. They were okay. So how much of a red flag is that forty time? Because I do think he's a good receiver. I talked to him in Frisco at the Shrine game, and boy, he's a former quarterback. He gets how to play the position. He's a really smart player. Mm-hmm. How much is that forty time? You know, scary, or did the other parts of the workout make you not as worried about it? Nothing moved on the stack for me. I had him as as a late round pick, six six or seventh round pick. That's going to be a very, you know, one dimensional slot. Get open underneath, make some things happen after the catch. Gadget return yep. specialist type. Um, there's a lot of good slot receivers in this class that he's going to fall. He's going to be the victim of that. Where I think he's just going to get pushed down the stack. He's not going to be an outside guy. I know that at the Shrine Bowl, he did try to prove that he can win down the field, but. You know, I don't see that happening at the next level, and that 40 kind of confirmed it. Um, fun player, though. He's a guy that you'll, it will be easy to root for. Really good kid, hard worker, brings energy to the team. He's a try-hard guy. Uh, but remember, Malachi Corley didn't work out because he got COVID. So we're talking about another slot that's going to be in front of him. Um, the, the slot that I love, and I don't know if the Giants are looking for a slot. I don't know if Wandell is going to be pegged into that spot or he's going to be more of the Isaiah McKenzie gadget type. But Malik Washington from Virginia. He's on my I mean, list. Dude, I love him. 447, 19 bench press reps. I love it when the receiver's bench, by the way. Um, he, I think he had the best vertical in the group. He, his broad jump was 10-6. The vertical was 42 and a half. And the guy, his tape, I wrote him up a couple of weeks ago. I just, I found myself wanting to watch more tape because he was just so much fun to watch. Uh, a competitor. He's bigger and stronger than you think. You know, he's not your traditional Isaiah Williams type where he gets pushed around. Um, he's 191 pounds at five foot eight. You know, that's, that's a stocky build, you know, that really is. And, and he plays super fast, super twitchy. I think he was led the country in catches. He was second in yards. I mean, we're talking about check, 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 check next to his name. So if the giants are looking for a slot, that's the guy to look for. All right. Two other guys that I was impressed by on the bigger side. I didn't think Cornelius Johnson was going to work out that way. Mm. I liked him in Frisco, but boy, he had speed. I thought he was smooth in the workouts. He jumped well. His workout was great. And then I don't know how a 6'8 receiver and Johnny Wilson runs such good agility drills and change of direction, but oh boy, you know, there's something there. If a team can figure out how to use that dude, there's something there. Hey, you've seen Darren Waller up front plenty. That that's who Darren Waller was when he came out of college. He was he a was wide that receiver. Skinny? What? He was that I, skinny when he came out? You know what? Off the top, I was just looking at this. I think he weighed in at around 240. And if I remember correctly, wasn't I think Wilson me- measured in closer to 240 at the senior bowl as well. Yep. I thought he was 238, if I if I remember correctly. Yes, that's about right. That's about the same. You're right. It's I, I debate this with one of the other scouts at our lads. He's like, hey, wide receiver all day. And I said, he's going to be a slot tight end at some point. And I agree you know, with it's, you. It, it's I have him as a tight really, end. Yeah, you think he's a tight end? Good. All right. So I'm going to go to I'm going to go to him and tell him that you agree with me so I can I can get that win. Uh, but it's no matter what. I mean, this is what he is. He's an offensive weapon. You know, he, he has so many concentration drops on tape and it bothers you. And but. You know, it, it seems to me just based on these drop rates that some of these teams are using, what you know, 
these teams are using first round picks on wide receivers that have a 10% drop rate. Zay Flowers was one of them um, that, Hey, we'll trade the occasional drop, occasional drop for these big plays and touchdowns, because this guy, you know, this is like a Jimmy Graham type, you know, you give him to a Sean Payton, the guy's going to be a star, you know, in the red zone, he's just going to score a ton of touchdowns. And that's where a lot of offenses struggle. You know, you put them in that closed box at the end of the field. They just don't know what to do. They don't have as much space to work with and you have to create matchup problems and putting this guy on the field creates a matchup problem. So, you know, if the giants were interested in Darren Waller, you're going to have a hard time convincing me that they're not interested in this kid. Um, it just seems like it might be a little bit of a luxury pick for a team that needs to build the foundation. Yeah, no, I'm with you. We didn't mention Roma Dunze. We probably mm. should have because he's <laughs> massive. Like, he just yeah. looks like an NFL player standing next to him. Yeah. Mid, mid four fours jumped really well. His agility thing tests were better than I thought they were going to be after watching his tape. So was his speed to be quite honest with you. Mm. Uh, look, this is as safe of his pick as, as you can get. I mean, I, yeah. you pick him in the top 10, you plug him in, you know he's going to be awesome. And to me, that is a really big luxury. I mean, after seeing the measurables and watching him, I, I know he doesn't separate quite as well against man-to-man as some other guys, and I'm the first one to say that. But yep. really, with everything else he does so well, Dave, I mean, this is a plug-and-play. We know exactly what we're going to get in terms of a player and a guy, and I, I think that's a really good position to be in if you're a team. Yep. Wide receiver two for me, you know, him and Malik neighbors are right there, but if you put a gun to my head right now, who am I taking? It's Odunze. He's been my number one receiver beyond Marvin Harrison, obviously uh, since the, since the summer and that never, never wavered on that. And I just want to throw a little challenge at the separation. It's true. He didn't separate much, but I think that actually had more to do with the Washington scheme than him. Just that the routes were predictable. They didn't run a wide route tree. And that's something that he probably will have to put some extra work on, but you listen to this kid talk, read to what coaches say about him. The intangibles are off the charts. Don't worry about him developing what he needs to develop skill-wise. Roma Dunze, I think, once he's in a more sophisticated offense where it's not predictable what they're going to do, um, he's going to be able to separate. When you watch him move, there, there's an elegance, an elegant explosion to him that you just don't see. That translates to, to the route running. And then you can cross-check that with all these workout times. I mean – the dude is 212. He's going to beat guys up that get in his face. He, you're going to be afraid of him getting over the top. Uh, I, I have no fear of him being a big time number one wide receiver at the NFL. Yeah. And I think eventually he'll play at 220. I don't know if he tried to yep. shed weight to run better, but I, he, just his frame, he looks like a guy that'll play at 6'2, 220 all day. All right. Final Agreed. two questions for you, Dave. We'll keep it broad. Overall, overarching thoughts on this draft class as a whole. You can relate it to the Giants if you like. In terms of strengths, weaknesses, uh, after we've gotten through the combine here with a little bit less than two months to go until the NFL draft. I wow, can't believe that's it's, it's going to be here. This is going to be a crazy two months. Hey, where the Giants need the most help, the draft is the strongest. And I'm not talking about just one spot. You know, I know the quarterback spot is a very debated topic with uh, in, in Giants land right now with the fans. You know, should they give up on Jones or not? If you do, if they are going to give up on him, this quarterback class is going to provide a, a big time starter for them. If you want to move forward with him, where, where is the draft the strongest wide receiver, offensive line, edge rusher. If you ask me, where are the giants biggest needs? That's it. Offensive line, wide receiver, edge rusher. So if they play their cards, right, they should be able to get multiple good players to fill all of those spots that not only can help them out for the future, but in 2024, and I'll throw a corner in there, too. That's a need, yeah. and it's also a very good corner class. So I'm with you. All right, now let's just lock in. If, if I steal Joe Shane's Giants GM baseball cap and I throw it on your head, what, what's your thought process as right now at number six for the Giants? So what they should do is I, I think this team needs to start the quarterback clock over. And, you know, I love Daniel Jones as a person. I think he's been professional since he's been drafted, but there's two factors Um, I just don't think he's reaching that upside. I I do think mentally he's just not processing the way we would expect a quarterback that's been in the league for as long as he has to be able to do it. Um, I do hope that he can get a Geno Smith, Baker Mayfield opportunity elsewhere and and reach that physical upside, but I just don't think it's going to be here. Um, And the injuries, I mean, you're talking about neck and ACL, but 
I want the Giants to draft a quarterback. And I can tell you right now that based on who I think is going to be available and without giving up too much of the R lads grading process right now, I think JJ McCarthy is the best fit. Um, I th- and I think it's the most realistic player to be there at number six. Um, and I'm sure, you know, I'll talk about McCarthy more in the future, but that's the kind of guy that I think can come in and you play Daniel Jones in 2024. And I know that's going to be a really tough situation for him. The first interception he throws, you'll hear the boo birds come down, but we've seen this song and dance a lot in the past that someone feels the pressure from a young quarterback coming in plays the year of his life, true breeze and and LA. And now the giants have a trade chip at this time next year. Um, You can't get rid of that contract prior to 2024. So that's out. That's not even in the picture. But I want to see Daniel Jones under center for at least the start of the 2024 season. And you groom this young quarterback under him. I'm a big fan of what the Chiefs did with Patrick Mahomes. You sit him for most, if not the entire first season. That's another one right there. Alex Smith went out and played the year of his year, uh, had the best year of his career with Patrick Mahomes sitting right beneath him. And, And that's going to create an opportunity for the quarterback down the road. And it's also an economic decision. You restart that quarterback clock for, for the salary cap. All right. Let me just follow up as a scout, knowing how you grade players and how seriously you take them. Yeah. Would you have trouble in your heart of hearts as you turn in that card, picking McCarthy over someone like Roma Dunze? Because of the value of the position, would I have trouble? Yeah. It'd be a hard decision. Um, but I'll tell you what, you're never going to get to Roma Dunze's upside if you don't have the right quarterback. And as flashy as these wide receivers, like a Dunze look, I mean, every year you got, you got really good receivers coming to the league. And it's a position that every, I feel like we say this every single season. Oh man, have you seen these wide receivers? They're so yeah, deep. There's right. so many of them. That's going to be the case every year. So as much as I like Roma Dunze on and off the field, um, you got to get the quarterback first. That's how you build this thing. And then you can find, that kind of wide receiver. And Hey, if you have some extra funds to work with, work with paying a rookie quarterback, you can do what the giants did in 05 and, and buy a receiver like Plaxico Burris. Obviously we're not done yet, but when all said and done, where do you think McCarthy is going to wind up on your big board? Top 10. Oh, really? Okay. Yep. yep. I can tell you that he'll probably be top 10. Again, this is factoring in positional value. I, I do it a little different than some, but I do factor position value. Uh, but, you know, if you're going to just use, you know, the, the number that you get without the quarterback value next to it, he'll be top 20. But that that value of the quarterback and the economics that are behind it, especially now, um, he'll be a top 10 player. And I'm I'm putting my not my neck out for that. I know I'm probably outside the norm on it, but there's just so much about him. I did not like him like that. I called him day two when he declared for the draft. And then I watched all the film from 2023 and 2022 And I think he's got it, dude. I really do. Yeah, look, I'm through eight games on him, and I like him better than I did before I started, and I still have another six or seven to go. Um, I'm curious to see where I wind up at the end of the process because, I, you know, things change when you watch more, and and that's the beauty of watching the tape, right? So real quick, because I think you are hiring him the most, thing you like about McCarthy's game the most and thing that has you most worried about him not maybe achieving all the potential that you see inside of him. So I, I think Marth McCarthy is a step ahead mentally um, when it comes to a processing uh, the defense, but also you know, he, he just anticipates where the defense, you can tell he watches film and you could tell he knows even just player to player tendencies. He could look at a Jersey number pre-snap and tell you what he's going to do after this play action look. And that, that to me is, is like that obsessive trait of a quarterback of Tom Brady, Peyton Manning, Patrick Mahomes. They're so into the mental side of the game that they, they just, they're a step ahead. And that's, you need to be, to be a quarterback in the NFL. If you're not a step ahead, you're a step behind. Um, the worry with me is that he just never had to put the team on his back. You know, I mean, how many of these quarterbacks passed the ball eight times in a big win against Penn State? And that's not his fault. You can't use that against him. And there is no such thing as a perfect prospect, especially a quarterback. You know, all these guys, you can throw red flags, red flag. And his red flag is you don't know how he will respond to being a guy that needs to drop back 45 times, seven weeks in a row um, in bad weather in the playoffs against the best defenses in the NFL. He just, he hasn't done it. Yeah. And he hasn't had to play from behind, right? I mean, something that just hasn't had to do again, not his fault, but it's something that he hasn't proven yet. And look, I think the two things that I'd say is that the deep ball, Again, I think he throws everything on a line drive. I want to see more touch on the deep ball. I think it was better in the workouts. He got some air in those passes, which was great. 
Um, and then the other thing, too, and I think this goes to your first point. He puts that ball into some traffic in the middle of the field sometimes where you're like, <laughs> dude, you have no business trying to get that ball in there. Ohio but he State. gets it in there. But I wonder <laughs> yeah. how much of that is his understanding the defensive player's tendency, knowing he can yeah. get it in there. So that's the other thing. I do think if he plays quickly at the next level, you are going to have some interceptions early in his career as he tries to put the ball into some windows in the middle of the field. But I'd rather have to pull a guy back from that than try to push him to do it, you know? Yeah. And uh, yeah, no one hates turnovers more than me. If anything, I put too much into them. But there's something to be said about that, you know, the, the effort mentality where like, Hey, I'm going to go for it. I'm going to trust myself here. And if I turn the ball over fine, you know, Patrick Mahomes had a career high turnovers this past year. And again, I shouldn't be bringing up that name. Um, I hate when others do that when they talk about Caleb Williams, but um, there's a confidence about him and there's a situational awareness about him where he knows when to take the risk and when not to. I also think he's the best quarterback in this entire class when it comes to pressure. You know, what can he do against pressure, both with his arms and legs? He just has that that mentality um, that that I think separates the, the, the quarterbacks that make it and the quarterbacks that do not. It's between the ears. Dave, I'm sorry for taking you so long here, man. I was not expecting to go an hour, 20 minutes. I was going to go 45, and my God, the conversation <laughs> was just too good. Uh, before we say goodbye, tell the folks where they can find all your stuff. Our lads is a draft guy. Tell them about everything you guys are doing. Yeah, um, on Twitter, I'm at rlads underscore sci, uh, and uh, I'm trying to be as active as I can on there. I'm just trying to balance all the work that we need to do right now. We have we have a, a quite the task in front of us over the next three weeks, but we always find a way to get it done. Um, the rlads draft guide can be purchased at rlads.com. We are coming out with a PDF version for those that like it on the monitors. Um, we're trying to make it more tablet and phone friendly, so just look out for that. I'm a huge I just want to push everyone, get the hard copy. I, I think it's a lost art that we have a book in front of us and we go through the pages rather than looking at a screen. We're, at, we're in front of a screen too much these days. So I really want to push you guys to, uh, we're still paying the money and probably losing some money on printing it. And we're going to continue to do that because I think there's a lot of value in it. Um, we just started a YouTube channel for our lads. First time I've ever done this, they know, which is a, if you know the story and history of our lads, that's a big deal. So we're trying to put out content every week. So if you guys could head over to YouTube and just subscribe to the our lads channel, uh, that would really deeply appreciate that. And, uh, we're always, always welcome to positive and negative feedback. And I'll try to comment back to people in the comment section. Um, you know, it's fun to talk draft. I at no point ever think I'm right and everyone else is wrong. I come up, we come up, our staff is unique in that we don't use the opinions of others to, to really sway ours. We're, you'll see in our position stacks, we're pretty different and it, it comes from hours and hours of conversation and tape. So we'd really appreciate if you guys could uh, go and, and like and subscribe that stuff. Dave, awesome stuff, my friend. Thanks so much for being with us. We'll catch you uh, up with you soon before the draft. Awesome, John. Thank you so much. Dave Severson from Our Lads. We thank you for joining us on the John Soto Podcast, brought to you by Citizens, the official bank of the Giants. We'll see you next time, everybody.